Patty was talking about what we do to medical students. The uh, historically, you know, you know, you guys know I'm crazy about infectious diseases. So, the um, uh, when you go to Scotland again, the, and the, you know, the British Open thing, the uh, most famous uh, Scottish physician was a guy named John Hunter, and they named this medical museum after him. And he was brilliant, brilliant guy, but he ha and he had one fatal flaw and that is uh, his scientific method. He was the first person to believe that syphilis and gonorrhea were two different diseases, because in the past they just let, linked it all as the clap and you know the French disease, and because the syphilis was, this was in the 1700s, syphilis was still a, a relatively uh, new disease brought back by Columbus in the, in, in the late 15th century. So uh, he decided that he's gonna prove it once and all, so he had a criminal, of course, all criminals have venereal diseases. Yeah, it was hung, uh, and after he was hung, he took some erythral secretions and inoculated himself to prove that, because the, the, the criminal had gonorrhea, that gonorrhea and syphilis were separate. Unfortunately, the person had syphilis also. Um, and to his dying day, and his dying day was, was he was apparently in the medical society building, banging on the table, swearing that there are separate diseases when his syphilitic aortic aneurysm blew and he died. So uh, a hundred years later, no one wanted to touch that topic. A Frenchman named Ricot uh, uh, decided he was going to test it and do the same experiment, but he used medical students. And I don't know if you had continued to stay in medical school or get extra credit, but he inoculated uh, med the medical students with gonorrhea. Luckily, he didn't have syphilis. He proved it was different and we were back on track. So. A couple hundred years later, here we are, uh, STD guidelines. The government does with, is every four or five years, they get together hundreds of, uh, of uh, uh, experts for each different disease. Uh, there's committees that then have subcommittees. You take all that information. This happened in April 2013. That information then goes to the CDC. The CDC then runs it through their lawyers, because I know, because my recommendations, they always had the lawyers come back and say, you can't say this, you can't say that. A lot of it has to be evidence-based. Uh, they got sued back uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago for saying things that people thought were, 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 were right. There was no data. People got sick and died. Uh, an example for us from OBGYN was the uh, PID guidelines in the past had um, uh, flagell and gent. You know, they figure the surgeons use that. Well, that's intra-abdominal. It's not intra-pelvis, uh, and patients uh, didn't didn't do well uh, with uh, some of the strep diseases, and uh, people died, got sued, and the government said evidence-based only. Now, there's, as Dr. Tepetti said, there's a lot of a lot of a lot of our medicine. You can't do the studies. It's not evidence-based. So what the government does now is, and it's just two people. It's just two people do this. So it took them a almost a year to get to assimilate the data. They then put it out into a document, uh, almost 300 pages uh, for, the, for the public and everybody to look at and make comments. And just last month, just a couple of weeks ago, they finally published the guidelines. So these are brand new, hot off the press. Uh, and, um, and when they, they know things, Kimberly Rokowski is in charge. She was, I was at faculty at Emory with, and uh, she worked with us. Uh, she's in the internal medicine department there. What she does is if she's pretty sure it's right, but there's no evidence, she says some experts, you'll see some experts say or refer to an expert. And that's the way they, they want to say it, but the lawyers at the, at the, at the uh, state department or the federal, federal uh, department won't let them say that. So the references in your handouts and everything are two or three weeks old, so they're new. So. The guidelines themselves, you know, we'll change these slides on the website. You can get to the, Randy is, is uh, nodding. What we always do is we update all the slides to get in the website. You can look at them afterwards. You, you, uh, if you uh, uh, here applied for the course, you can get those. There's an app, just like everything, there's an app now. It really is pretty functional. And again, the official recommendations were announced in the uh, monthly report uh, in June uh, last year. And they're narrowed it down to 140 pages. It's still a lot of stuff. As you know, you're here year after year, I'm not going to go over things that you know about or you can look up very easily. What I want to highlight are the things that changed. These CDC guidelines 
when the number one purchaser of these guidelines are hospitals, medical libraries, things like that. Number two are law firms. Uh, you know, when I asked uh, Kimberly Orkowski at the CDC, she says uh, that they make a significant amount of money uh, off of uh, law firms. You know, if you, if I wrote a study recently, if you Google the disease, the top five things back are law firms. You know, you think you know information about so and so. When you get to the when you get to the website, it said if you had this, you know, please call our number. Uh, so those are the update information. It'll be on the website. You can get it from from me here. So here are the nine things that have changed. Again, you know that you've seen the CDC guidelines. You know how to get to them. You go to cdc.gov, put in 2015 guidelines. Last month you had to put in 2014 preliminary guidelines, but now um, it's 2015. Uh, guidelines are official. So number one is gonorrhea is uh, changing. The disease is becoming more resi resistant, and so there's changes in, in guidelines uh, for gon treatment guidelines for gonorrhea. Number two, testing uh, for trichomonas has changed. It was, it was a very interesting meeting that I was at in Washington, uh, and um, uh, in fact, you know the the people, a lot of people making decisions. You know, they're definitely not OBGYNs, and some aren't physicians. And they looked at it, and there's a group uh, that works at the at the uh, FDA and the CDC that are just well, I, I call them politicians, but they're basically you know you know epidemiologists or 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 bean counters. And they said, you know what, gonorrhea is so low. Let's stop screening for gonorrhea and just start screening for trich trichomonas. There's more trichomonas. And I said. The reason gonorrhea is low is because we're screening for it. You stop screening for it, it's going to go up. And they go, oh, no, no, it's been low for years. I said, you've been screening for years. So luckily, they, did, they didn't drop their, but they, were, they originally started with a recommendation to drop gonorrhea screening to save money and, and put it into trichomonas instead. But, um, but they are different tests, and we'll talk about them. Alternate treatments, new treatments for genital wart, mycoplasma genitalium in the infectious disease STD world, that's where we have our most arguments over. Um, I'm, I'm a believer in mycoplasma genitalium. The males uh, have had lots of pages, lots of data um, that's based on urethritis. And urethritis mycoplasma seems to be a significant component. It's NGU, non-gonococcal urethritis, because because gonorrhea doesn't cause all urethritis, and it's a little more difficult and, and harder to look for mycoplasma. But the cervix and the urethra are their anatomical changes. Ten years ago, or even eight years ago, you look at the cervicitis guidelines. There were two paragraphs, and I kept saying you've got to spend more time time with this, and and they're starting to listen. And I, and I remember at, at Washington in a meeting, I said, I said a guy pees and it hurts, ten billion dollars worth of research. A woman has cervicitis, she has white cells in her cervix, nobody cares, you know, and, and they didn't like that, but uh, luckily they're listening. Uh, new HPV counseling messages, uh, I will show the CDCs, I have my own. Uh, new section on management of transgender individuals, you know, it, it, this, 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 in the last six months, this section has increased, surprisingly so, of course. Um, and um, annual testing for hepatitis C, updated recommendations for diagnostic evaluation for urethritis and retesting for infections. Again, a lot of this stuff is it's now the standard of care. It's easily found. Your patients really don't go to here because they don't think they have STDs, uh, but you've got to know it. Uh, I don't, I spend, oh, maybe five or 10% of my time defending doctors and in, in, in cases. It always comes up with, you know, they, they consider this the gold standard. The lawyers always consider this. This is what you should know and you have to know. It's easy to get to. I don't really care about the lawsuits. I care about you taking care of your patients. Uh, and uh, again, they spend a lot of time. There's a lot of evidence going through this. So let's go through them one by one. Um, when you get to gonorrhea, the uh, cultures uh, are, and the testing is difficult. Last year or the year before, I gave a, a lecture on uh, testing. Uh, and office testing, and again, it, it's a mess. It's because the insurance companies bid out their 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 um, lab tests to one company and a winner. The winner has the lowest bid. When they win the bid, you know, I say United, they have 70 million patients. Let's just say it's $100 per member per year for for testing, all testing. 
They get that bid. They celebrate for a whole day. Oh, $7 billion. Well, we won the award. The next day they're sitting around saying, how are we going to do this for $7 billion? You know? And they start making cuts. And they cut here and they cut there. And what they cut very drastically is the quality of the tests for OBGYN for women's health. They're not going to shortchange the 80-year-old in the ICU with pneumonia, ventilator dependent pneumonia because you want to get that culture right. But for vaginal cultures, they don't care. We talked about it before, your herpes tests. There's two tests on the market. If, they, if it's FDA approved, uh, that's great. The problem is FDA approves tests on the market, but they don't bother. They don't have the regulatory power to take a test off the market. Medicare has the power to take tests on the, on the, off the market. Medicare is not going to spend one dime of your tax dollars looking at STD tests. Uh, for the Medicare population and whether they're still accurate or not. They think the marketplace will do that. The marketplace doesn't do that. The insurance company picks the cheapest test. So if you pick the cheapest uh, herpes test, which most companies do, it's false positive 88% of the time. So you're telling your patient they have herpes, 88% of the time it's false positive. Chlamydia gonorrhea, 60% false positives. So when you have a patient that you say, gee, your test came back positive for chlamydia or gonorrhea, it's only, it's a, there's a 60% chance it's a false positive. So, so again, the CDC, on, on, they're, they're nice people. They try really hard. They really are a very nice part of the, they try to, they try to, um, to uh, help you with that. So they stick these things in the guidelines, but, but 140 pages, it's not easy reading. I, you know, I'll read it at the beach this weekend, but, but, uh, but that's because that's, I'm, I'm not a lot of fun. That's what I do. The uh, cultures, so required endocervical male and, and urethral Swab, these are swabs, these are cultures. You don't do cultures anymore. You know, you don't do gram stains anymore. The nucleic acid tests um, have the widest variety of what you can collect. For OBGYNs, we do just, you can just use your cervical, uh, cervical smear, vaginal swabs your, for men, urethral swabs, and urine for both men and women. The tests perform differently. Uh, and again, there's a different collection device for each different company for each different sample. And it gets very, very confusing. I know you, you're, you're there. You want to test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. You go, you're, you talk to your nurse. She hands you something. Then is your, this patient insurance company, you use LabCorp. They use Quest. Can you send it out someplace else? And so they wind up getting a sample that's not in the right specimen. And it's even worse. Usually, they'll reject it. Uh, not usually. Sometimes they'll reject it. Usually they'll just run it, and they don't care what the result is because that's the, one, the sample you sent them. So I'm really I'm not so happy about insurance companies. I'm not really happy about labs. I'm trying to work with them to help them out. The uh, nucleic acid tests are not cleared for any place else but urethra and cervix. So if, if you have someone, you say, I'm going to take an oral pharyngeal swab, it's not, it's not um, um, accurate. Again, I've told you the story in, in the past. You know, you may think it's not that important. Well, when a woman walks in with her lawyer saying she's divorcing her husband and she's going to sue him for millions of dollars because of this STD test they got, you know, and I tell her it's probably a false positive because she took the wrong sample from the wrong place with the wrong kit, she's not happy. She's not happy. But again, the, the good news for that story was the husband didn't know that the test was wrong, so he confessed, and, uh, and she, uh, she got the divorce and the big settlement. So I, if he would have asked me, I would have told him, Plead the fifth. CDC no longer recommends the use of cefixime. This is the big thing. Cefixime was a nice alternative, was an oral treatment for, for gonorrhea instead of giving them, instead of storing the shots and giving them, a, you know, this, uh, the uh, ceftriaxone and giving them a shot. There's some resistance developing, relative selfless born resistance, especially the oral, and it's not recommended as first line treatment. You could use it as second line treatment, but have an excuse why you're not going to give the ceftriaxone. The only regimen is, is now ceftriaxone, but it's dual treatment. It's dual treatment, ceftriaxone with azithromycin for two reasons. One, the ceftriaxone and the azithromycin seem to have a synergistic effect and, and keeps the, the for, for posterity and for the general population, it keeps the relative risk of developing resistance to ceftriaxone low. Um, and the second reason is the gonorrhea and chlamydia tests are so inaccurate. If you have gonor if you have gonorrhea, there's a 25 to 50 percent chance you have chlamydia, and the test missed it. So they don't even rely on the test anymore. Uh, azithromycin, the the um, dose is one gram. For gonorrhea by itself, it has a indication for two grams. 
you really shouldn't use it. We did the original study. The original study for one gram of zithromycin or gonorrhea was good. It was 93% accurate, but you don't, or it's successful. You don't get FDA approval unless you're 95% accurate. So to get 95%, we doubled the dose and went to uh, two grams. Uh, the problem with zithromycin, it has a very long half-life. You give it, it lasts for 14 to 21 days. Uh, if you get high levels, you get a lot of GI side effects and you get a lot of nausea and vomiting. If somebody's on doxycycline or, or some other medication and they, they call me up, as soon as I take this medication, I, I throw up violently and I, I just tell them stop taking it. With the zithromycin, it's already in their body. It starts raising at seven to 14 days. It's at maximum peak. It stays there for 21 days. So we have to hospitalize people on the study for, for intravenous you know, uh, fluid therapy because they had nausea and vomiting that lasted for seven to 10 days. So it's, if you get it in there, and they have an adverse event, it's gonna last for a long time. So the one gram dose isn't as bad, we use it for chlamydia. And again, the treatment for gonorrhea, if you anybody in your practice with gonorrhea, well, first thing, any test that comes back positive for gonorrhea, it's more, it's 50%, and your type of practice, if you're in New Orleans the week after Mardi Gras, it's probably a true positive. But uh, if, um, if it's um, uh, in your practice, uh, the chances are uh, it's a false positive. But, um, and then you have to either treat them or prove it's not a false positive. Don't treat them based on a false test and give them the wrong treatment. So don't, do, don't be doubly negative. Again, I, I do a lot of defense work, but if we get to the point where you're just not following the recommendations, they're easy to see, and I just tell them to settle. But uh, for the most part, um, you'll, you'll, get, you'll treat them and get rid of them. The problem is it'll come back. It comes back because it's not resistant, it's like trichomonas, it's not resistant. It's just that the reason they got it is because someone's else in the relationship and you can treat them and then unless they give up their boyfriend or girlfriend, they'll get it back and they'll say, you didn't treat me right, you know, but you did treat them right. Okay, so uncomplicated cervix, urethral rectum, ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams, 175 milligrams works, 125 milligrams works. If you're reading the studies, they don't want to do the low dose, they want to go straight to 250. Uh, because they want you to prevent resistance, plus azithromycin one gram orally. Okay, if you don't have ceftriaxone, and again, they make it, the CDC really tries hard. They don't, they say if it's not available, this may not be available in your office. You have a question, Yes, a uh, question? What is your allergic Yeah, if you're, if you're allergic, if you're, if you're allergic to ceftriaxone, um, you know, septic seems to supplement spore, you just give them the, 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 the dose of, of, um, of uh, azithromycin. You can use spectinomycin, but it's not available in the United States. The alternate recommendation was spectinomycin, but they took it off because you can't get it in the United States. So it's going to be azithromycin. Then it, then it goes into talk to, your, talk to your little specialist. And what we'd give them, we'd give them a genomycin, which would be close to spectinomycin. We'd just give them a, a shot of uh, genomycin. And, and, you know, I may give them a quinolone. To, you know, we, we'll check, we'll check. If that happens, you would send the patient to me. I would do a culture. I would do sensitivities, and i test, and i treat them based on the sensitivity. Because what's going to happen is they're going to get it back and say, oh, you didn't, you didn't treat me, you know, and I said no. And I do this all the time. Here's your, your, gut, your bug, here's the sensitivities. I gave you this, you know, I gave it to you where I saw you, I gave it to you intravenously, I saw you take it, and so you got it back. And I've done that hundreds of times, and 199 out of 200 times, you know, they both say, oh no, I don't have any other partner, and then the wife calls me back and said, yeah, I, I trusted you, I had him followed. He, has, he stops on the way home at some strip joint and got a girlfriend. Why aren't you culturing everybody? I mean, if you, get, if you get a positive, why don't you culture it? Oh, I do. I have my own lab. But you try, well, you try to culture. If and you're, you're in a pri regular private office, you try to culture. How are you going to, how are you going to do it? I mean, you just the, the, the insurance company, LabCorp will not supply you with the plates. You can ha tell them to go to the state lab, and they'll culture them there. And they they want to get, they want you to go to the state lab. The state, state and the federal government wants you to go to their labs because they want to see what the changing pattern of sensitivity is. But the insurance companies, they won't. And the uh, the um, the uh, LabCorp, well, I hate to say bad things. But I work with them. I'm trying to get them to do better. 
but they won't they won't help they you know, if you push them they'll say yes we'll send a plate to you next week and you know and then send it to the lab make sure you you put it in the carbon mi carbon dioxide bag and send it to the lab within 45 minutes you know but um, generally it's, it's very hard to do I mean ask for a, a you know a, you know you know any of the stuff and it's you know and uh, it's very hard to get your labs to do it so it's really a disadvantage but yes the answer is culture um, so nucleic acid test for trichomonas again I, I, I just I'm highlighting most of the changes but you know trick is caused by trichomonas vaginalis there's a lot of trick it's it's the number one non-viral sexually transmitted disease in the United States uh, 10 20 30 percent of people in 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 uh, New Orleans Las Vegas some other states very high rate when, when you want to do the studies you go to you go to New Orleans you go to Las Vegas you go to a few other places and and you get um, collect samples very very quickly 11% uh, of women over 40 years of age that's the one thing where we, we seem to steam, seem to stop screening when they get to be 25 uh, but it's really not that the wording is not 25 it's that routine screening is under 25 but screening for all ages with high risk factors and with trichomonas it's a risk factor um, at 627 is the reference but uh, in the and 13% uh, of black women in the United States overall is a lot of trick out there um, and it's associated with significant increased risk of HIV associated two to three fold so that's why it's a major STD importance um, it's also at risk for preterm birth and adverse pregnancy outcomes and PID uh, and PID specifically with women with HIV infection so it's a significant and serious infection um, for asymptomatic individuals routine screening uh, with HIV is, is recommended currently uh, uh, because of the adverse events so if you have a patient with HIV you add trick to your annual recommendations again that's that's something new this year again I been doing all these studies for the tests and I said I don't need these tests I can see trick under the microscope and so I did the trials and you know I missed 10 to 20 percent uh, and I stay a long time I put, I do a wet prep and look under the microscope in almost every one of my patients because I just have fun and I and I and I and I look at it and I didn't think I'd, I missed 20, 10 to 20 percent and I spent a long time uh, looking for them for, for you know the average microscope that you know that is not used a lot and, and uh, it's probably you know 50 percent so you really are missing a lot just looking under the microscope uh, the uh, pap smear don't rely on your pap smear a lot of them are, are, are um, uh, computerized now and even if not it's not moving it's hard to see and pathologists aren't any better than 50 60 percent anyway there's a approved test it used to be a company called Genprobe Hologic bought them is cleared for vaginal and cervical specimens and urine from symptomatic and asymptomatic women it's an RNA transcription mediated amplification it works pretty pretty good uh, very similar prevalence to the new HPV test for pap smears and has a really good sensitivity and specificity uh, so uh, you can order that uh, it's a nucleic acid test Hologic is the one with the uh, approval a lot of you probably have uh, uh, Aptima Hologic stuff in, in your office or in your hospital so you just check it off on your on your uh, on your list of things you want now in women if you urine because the ure urethra the whole reason why you have bladder infections because the urethra is shorter and it's right there in the in the introitus uh, you get a hundred percent you know you have it in the vagina you'll generally if you look you'll see it in the urine and if it's in the urine you'll find it in the vagina because there's so much cross contamination it's really easy and the men uh, if you don't get it you got to get it from the uh, from the urethra um, and if not there's a low sensitivity and they miss it a lot in the urine because it's harder to get in the urine the problem is you know for us so they'll be joined I'll tell her I'm treating you for trichomonas don't have sex wherever you had sex with the last six months unless you know that they're treated or they're negative the guy doesn't uh, he, you know he doesn't get treat he doesn't get he maybe takes the treat treatment he maybe takes the goes and gets a test he gets a test they see the guy the you know, person in the office says here pee in the cup they pee in the cup that says negative and again 60% of the time it'll be a false negative um, it's hard I, I take 
the uh, I, my treatment, we'll go to treatment, but I'll tell you my treatment now, instead of taking the whole uh, two grams at once, I have them take one gram, because two grams they vomit a lot, uh, one gram they vomit less. I have them take one gram now, one gram in 12 hours, that's the way they do it in England. Uh, if you take the whole two grams, about 25% of the women will get sick and vomit. So I give them the, the two grams, they go home, they're, they're sick and vomiting, their husband comes home, uh, and, he, and he says, what's the matter with you? He says, oh, medicine made me sick, here's your dose. Um, and, and he says, well, you know what, I'll go and I'll, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll take it later. He puts it in his pocket, goes out drinking with the boys. Uh, usually he forgets about it. One time he didn't forget about it. He popped them on the way back from drinking. Of course, he started vomiting out the window, hit a tree, uh, and he sued because he said that the medicine made him sick and that's why he hit the tree. But, um, so, uh, but it didn't win the case. Luckily, we have nice judges. Um, so uh, again, so when when the, your patients, oh, my husband got tested. They said it was negative. You can ask, and if, if they say it was a urine test, it's it's not exactly true. Uh, the BD has some tests that, that are cl uh, cleared for for women, uh, and uh, that's good because they also have it cleared for gonorrhea and chlamydia. So if you can have a sample, you can test them for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and, and uh, trichomonas at the same time. Again, you can see, and this is two, three pages on the CDC guidelines. The CDC is spending a lot of time uh, trying to tell you that the tests are different, that you're not getting accurate results, and you need to, to think about, gee, she still has white cells, she still complains of irritation, but the test says it's negative. You know, think about maybe the test is wrong. So it's, it's not the, you know, if the glove fits, you must, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. You know, this DNA stuff isn't, isn't uh, uh, totally accurate uh, all the time. Um, again, other tests are, that are approved, again, they get approved, it's hard for them to get unapproved. There's some office tests called the OSUM. There's the VP Affirm, which is what you usually, usually see. The VP Affirm, I did the studies in the 80s and 90s. It's a small company that was in Washington, Bothell, Washington, the first time I ever heard of the area. It's a nice high-tech area. Um, and now Hologic owns it. Oh, no, no, now BD owns it. So maybe they're called BD uh, uh, Affirm, Affirm 3. It's the one you get. You know you got it when you said the three results. It says Gardnerella, Trichomonas, Candida. Okay, that test is over 20 years old. Um, it's it's the best test. For, I mean, it's the, if it's good for anything, it is pretty good for a Trichomonas, um, and uh, uh, it gets two thirds of them right. Okay, so um, when it's positive, it's it, the specificity is goes positive. But if it's negative, it doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, the OSIM test is an office test, again, about 80% positive, uh, uh, sensitive. So again, the test you're getting, use a lot of your, like Dr. DePetty says, use a lot of your, your clinical expertise and your clinical judgment. Just remember, the tests aren't perfect. That's the main point. Recommendations, a little bit, uh, I wanted to mention them because uh, they've changed a little bit. Uh, metronidazole, two grams in oral dose. Again, I just used the one gram, now one gram in 12 hours. Even if they forget to take the second dose because they got sick of the first dose, the efficacy is 88%. So it's 88% is better than, well, not less because if they take the two grams and throw it up, then they don't really have anything. Well, that's really not that true because if the levels were high enough to make them, because it goes centrally then to the GI tract, if the, if the levels were high enough to make you sick, you were high enough to get to kill the trick if they weren't extra sensitive. Tinidazole is out there. Uh, it's two grams in oral dose. It's, a, it's different than metronidazole in several ways. I think it's great. It used to be I had a whole laboratory that just did trichomonas sensitivity testing because there is about a 6 to 16 percent relative resistance, so people would take the drug, get it back, and we'd, I'd say, oh, somebody's cheating on you or or you know you didn't take your medication. And they said no, I did, and I don't have a partner anymore. And, and it would come, and it wouldn't it wouldn't go away. There was some relative resistance. What they did in the past, you either sent the sample to the CDC or my lab, and we told you the MIC. And if the MIC was 50, you had to increase your dose to 500 milligrams twice a day for a week. And if it was uh, 100, you go to two grams every day for a week. And if it was uh, you know 200, you have to give IV. Um, and uh, but you don't have to do that anymore. Tinidazole takes care of 99% of them currently. I'm, I'm sure the resistance will change. It's, it's really good, but just don't start out with that, and I'll tell you why in a second. Alternate therapy, again, they have problems. They said, I took that medicine last time I threw up. Give them the 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. 
uh, treatment. Uh, again, alcohol we know about. The difference is tinidazole, the reason it works, it's not just a short-acting metronidazole, it's really a long-acting metronidazole, and it lasts three times longer. So you can't tell them, don't drink alcohol with this. He said, don't drink alcohol with this, and don't, don't drink for th at least three more days. And I, I'm going on the safe side and tell them a week, but you tell them a week, if you're lucky, if you get three days. But if you don't tell them that, they're going to they're gonna get sick. Because of the rate of reinfection, 17% uh, in one study, and that's a study where we come in, we make you take your medication, we pay you for coming and taking your medication, we keep the diary of what you've been up to, uh, and still uh, it's 17%. So again, new recommendation is you retest them with three months of treatment, and it's different for different STDs. So somebody has trick, you bring them back in, uh, in two to three months, and you retest them uh, to see. Uh, you, the gnats, the gnats look at for RNA, so if you kill the, kill the trick, there's still the dead RNA floating around for up to 21 days, but uh, really it's cleared in about seven to 10 days. So you can bring them back in two weeks to test them again. Don't bring them back the next week because it'll still be positive. Okay, what, what, treatments, what treatments change because the green tea extract uh, on the bottom there uh, has been approved. So exogenal warts, imiquimod, it's always been there for a while, uh, podophylex, you know, the, you know, the old podophylline, the podophylline uh, uh, based medication uh, or your uh, green tea extract. I forget what the, what the veg, Verigin, is that the name of them? Is that the name, is that what it is? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, again, patient applied. Um, it's uh, the ointment. Uh, you could use it three times a day uh, and very thin, thin, thin level uh, and uh, you just keep using it until the warts are cleared. If they're still there four months later, take a look at them, make sure they're nothing, it's not, it's really warts, I'd biopsy them at the time. Uh, you don't wash it off after you use it, uh, and uh, it'll may cause some irritation on the partner, so uh, you should avoid, avoid the contact. Side effects, again, burning, pain, ulceration, all these therapies, just like the, the, um, the uh, pod podophylline, is cause some irritation, cause your interferon, locally to, to increase in the interferon it's what clean, cleans the, uh, uh, takes care of the skin. That's why we use interferons for melanomas, uh, you know, highly effective in skin, skin, skin uh, diseases. Uh, don't recommend with the HIV infection, other immune compromise, they don't have that immune system to fight that off. Uh, and um, uh, people with genital herpes, uh, there seems to be a problem. So when we did the studies, the problem is it causes irritation. So somebody, uh, we're putting on either the green tea extract or the, or the imiquimod or any, any, any therapy that's long-term, applied long-term. A week or two into it, they said, I can't take this medication. It's, it's killing me. It's horrible. It's terrible. I've broken out. What they have is they have the irritation inflammation. They set off a herpes infection, a herpes infection they didn't know they had, general uh, herpes type 2. Again, the studies, whether we did a herpes vaccine trial a couple of years ago, so we screened tens of thousands, 20,000 people. Um, again, say like the old data, 25% of people have herpes type 2. 90% didn't know they had it, okay? Uh, you know, I, you know, su suspect it. I'll have a patient, my typical patient is 40-year-old woman, comes in, hi, how you doing? Haven't seen you last year, how are the kids? Kids are fine, a little upset about the divorce. I go, oh, what divorce? Oh, I caught my husband cheating on me. Um, so we got a divorce. I said, that's too bad, how you doing? That's fine. The only thing different, she says, now I get these yeast infections all the time. I don't know what it is. I said, yeast infections? Yeah, about every three months, I get this itching irritation down there. I take a week's worth of monostat, you know, it goes away and, you know, I said, and I think in my head, it's not, she's got a recurrent herpes. She puts some moist, she puts some, some nice cream down there, makes her feel better for a while. By the time the, she's finished the seven-day course, you know, recurrent herpes, it, it goes away in five to ten days. Make the, the cultures are negative after two days, two to four days. Uh, and that's what's happening to her. So I said, I go, yes. I, I generally screen her. I said, I'm going to screen you, add some viral testing to it if I can. Or tell her when she has one of these outbreaks, come see me right away and I'll culture and then I'll, t I'll talk to her. I'm not going to, I don't bring it up with her right then and there. Um, but I don't let it go away. I said, either come back next time you have an outbreak or I start doing, I do the testing. Um, so 
what happens with the, all these patients when you treat warts and some irritation, they have this horrible outbreak. Again, I don't over the phone say, well, that's because you have herpes and you didn't know it. I just say, you know what, give it a break, you know, wait seven to 10 days, start a little lower dose and go back and do it. And then same thing happens, they'll go, they usually don't have an outbreak. Most people don't have an outbreak of herpes every month. Uh, so she goes two or three months later, she should be done with therapy. If she's still on therapy, she says, you know, I got another outbreak again. And, and, but she begins to realize it's not that she's allergic to it because she's used it for two months already. So just keep that in the back of your mind. It'll happen a lot, okay? With those patients. Not, again, same thing um, uh, uh, during pregnancy is unknown, so there's just no data on pregnancy. So to break it down, provider administered cryotherapy, this is the approved CDC guidelines. Provider therapy, uh, we have to 1045? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll be done. Provider, provider therapy, uh, surgical removal, you know, laser, you know, electrosurgery trichloracetic, bichloracetic acid. Um, they don't recommend the pedophilin anymore, although I still, still have it and use it. Uh, and let's go through it. So mycoplasma genitalium, there's nine, there's four. We're, we're, uh, I'm gonna move a little quicker and stop telling all my fun stories. They're fun, right? Yeah, they're fun. The, uh, again, I think that mycoplasma genitalium is a problem. So what's happened is, you, the good news is the CDC spends more time with cervicitis. The bad news is they put it in writing so probably 25% of the lawsuits are people that something bad happens in surgery, and when they go back, they can demonstrate they had cervicitis in the office, but no one treated them. So you've got to look at this now. Um, the cervicitis, you've got a mucopurulent or purulent discharge in your end, end, end of cervix, you know, and, um, or they have sustained endocervical bleeding. Uh, so you put, put, do your pap smear and they bleed. You got to think about, it. you got to, unless there's, wild ectropion, you got to think about cervicitis. You see pus there, it's fine. I'll take a sample, I'll look under the microscope, you see white cells all over the place, she's got cervicitis and proven otherwise. The only other thing that'll do that is a bunch of trichomonas, okay? If she has really bad trichomonas, gonorrhea, chlamydia, which you'll screen for. Uh, so, but you have either, look in the bottom, either or both might be present. So you've got some bleeding on a pap smear, you got mucoprolent discharge, you got to work up cervicitis, and that's what happens. Someone goes, uh, and these cervicitis is sometimes, you know, are mycoplasma. The really bad ones may be a strep. The really bad ones may be a group A strep. She then has a procedure. I hate, I don't want to scare you, uh, you know, about, you know, all, all different procedures, but anything transcervical, you're taking what's in the, tr in the, in the vagina and cervix, you throw it up in the uterus, and they get really sick. Um, so the, uh, the uh, women that die of infections, it's either, it's usually a group A strep or MRSA. My stance as the past president of Infectious Disease Society is we should be screening everybody for group A strep before we do anything transcervical. It's too expensive. The government's gonna, not gonna do it. But I'm trying to get the next step is screen them for white cells in the cervix. They have white cells in the cervix or something there, then work it up. And we're, I'm working with, um, with uh, several people now to see if we can come up with a quick and easy test for your office. But cervicitis is now there. It's usually asymptomatic. Patients don't complain about pain. Uh, again, vaginal discharge, intramenstrual, you know, bleeding. Um, if someone starts having intercourse. You put them on the pill. They start spotting. Um, you, you got it in the back of your mind. Say, say maybe it's not the pill. Maybe she's now having sex. The guy she had sex with had an STD. You know, gave it to her, and you need to screen her. So there's the things you got to start thinking about in your office. And the absence of va inflammatory vaginitis, again, these are my, my, the input I had to these guidelines. Again, leukorrhea may be the sensitive, most sensitive indicator. It really is. If you look at white cells, you know, and there are sheets of sheets of them, I, I didn't bring pictures, you got to think of cervical inflammation as a very high predictive value. When the uh, organism is, is present, it's usually gonorrhea and chlamydia. As I said at the meeting, that's because that's all we screen for. You know, if you only screen for gonorrhea and chlamydia, then the test that's gonna come back positive is gonorrhea and chlamydia. You're not gonna have a mycoplasma test came back if you just screen for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And again, when you do the NATS, it's not like they did a culture, they see five organisms, and they work them all up. They're just looking for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Uh, in fact, they were so, they, they got in trouble once because someone sent, or, or a couple of people sent tests off for group B strep in pregnancy. It turned out they had group A strep, the lab found it, but said, oh, they only paid for the group B strep. We're not gonna report the group A strep out. They gotta pay for that separately. Two, two women died 
they sued the OBGYNs. I looked at it and said, this is crazy. You know, I said, they got to have known it. They have known that. So they went and backed into the, to the laboratory and said, yeah, we had it, but that's not what they asked for. And I said, that could kill somebody. And it did. So the OBGYNs got let off and they sued the, sued the, uh, the, the lab companies. Um, and um, now they'll put it on your record for the most, the big companies will put it on your record because the, uh, I think it was a $5 million and a $10 million lawsuit. Both patients died. They also started, I really, I heard about that because what they started sending is group, you, you'll get a report back that says group G strep. And you know, what's group G strep? Group, group G strep acts like group A, so you treat it anyway. So we did a lot, but it's very, very rare, less than one third of 1%. But, um, uh, but again, if you're only looking for gonorrhea and chlamydia, that's all you're gonna find. Uh, you get cervicitis with trichomonas, you get it with herpes, uh, usually a primary infection. Again, but usually there's no organism found because you're not culturing for, for all the organisms. And again, um, especially in women that are great in 30 years of age, because over 25, you're not even screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia. So you really don't know what's there. I think it's probably mycoplasma. The data, men have service, have urethritis. They have sex with women. Women get urethritis. It's usually the same organism. Uh, and uh, so the big organisms in men are, are non-gonococcal urethritis, and it's mycoplasma urea plasma. Uh, again, it's limited data because they're limited studies. Douching doesn't cause cervicitis, you know, unless if you're douching with vinegar, just vinegar. I, 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 I think douching is great. All my patients douche. The data on douching is false and wrong. They've corrected it, but they haven't updated, you know, the internet. Um, but don't do it anyway because there's so much on the internet, you got to explain why you, you had them douche. Uh, cervicitis may repeat over and over again because you don't know what you're treating. Um, and um, especially if it's not gonorrhea and chlamydia. So, for that, that sign, again, cervicitis is a sign of upper genital tract disease. You got somebody with cervicitis, when they say they have adnexal pain, you take it seriously. You get, you, um, if they say they have adnexal tenderness, you need to test them. Again, government says gonorrhea and chlamydia, and in that, you can do it in any sample. You also should, should look for them for BV and trichomonas and other things and other organs. But basically, they're now saying cervicitis is important. We still don't know what to do, okay? The, uh, this is the data went before. If you highly, if you have white cells, and you don't know what the answer is, you know the CDC is now saying yes, you really pro probably just if you don't find the wet prep, should do another test. Uh, and again, greater than 10 white cells per high-powered field means that there's something there. And I, and for that, if you have 10, I would send them off for, for the, the at least the trick, if not other things. Treatment is azithromycin uh, and doxycycline. Local, luckily, uh, that's um, they're easy to treat. I would say, you know, for all the stuff, you know, 90% of my patients are infectious disease. I probably write doxy more than anything else for everybody, you know, for, for doxy. I don't see a lot of BV because BV is easy to treat. Uh, the, the, you know, the trick, I don't see that much trick because most trick is easy except for the, the, the um, rare, or not so much rare, the, the few resistant cases. And, and, and the rest of my practice is yeast. And, and uh, we can talk about that later. Uh, again, women diagnosis uh, for cervicitis. Again, these are must you must do. So you diagnose the cervicitis. You got to test them for HIV and syphilis. Fortunately, most of them will be negative. But if you miss somebody, you were supposed to do it. Um, uh, should return after treatment to see if it's gone because you don't know what is what it is. So you don't know how to treat it. So it generally doesn't go away. Uh, you need to keep treating it. That woman goes and has a hysterosalpingogram. Dr. Molinaro, I don't know if he's still here, but one of the best reproductive endocrinologist groups in the world. You know, the last thing they want to do is charge a patient $15,000 for a whole cycle, or 10, maybe it's 10, I don't want to overstate his prices, and then um, have a cervicitis that's not treated. It caused a loss of the, you know, the, the uh, in vitro fertilization. So uh, cervicitis, you keep, you keep following until you get rid of it. Uh, and again, because they don't know for sure, mycoplasma genitalium is, is an issue. Again, if it persists after azithromycin, doxycycline, uh, you got to think about did they take their medication? With one gram, it's not so hard to do. Uh, you can test it, and the next treatment after that is moxifloxin. Don't, you know, kill yourself over it. If you have somebody to send the patient to, you can do that. The, the internal medicine infection, these people know the data because it's they they do all the, the urethritis, and they understand mycoplasma genitalia. So for cervicitis, you can't find a gynecologist who wants to do it. The uh, infectious disease people can do a good job. And again, 
um, at the last statement, as they always do, if you keep having persistent symptoms, you can't get rid of it, just refer it to somebody, you know, uh, because you have to get rid of it. Otherwise, every transcervical procedure, hysterosalpingogram, in vitro fertilization, IUD placement, biopsy, you're responsible for what happens to that woman after that. <coughs> HPV counseling, I'll just tell you since we're going to be over in a, in, a, in a minute or two, it's just uh, new things about counseling. They, um, uh, and uh, they want you to talk to them about a lot of these women develop cervical cancer, uh, so they want you to think about giving them the vaccine, uh, also get hepatitis A, hepatitis B. Again, two vaccines, you know, so, so it recommended people HIV get the vaccine, and they're just talking about the vaccines for females and males. Um, you can vaccinate them through age 26, um, and males 21, uh, and vaccination is recommended all the way to age 26. And again, cdc.gov, HPV, lots of infection. Transgender, you know, we don't, we don't have to uh, spend too much time, I just want you to know it's there. There's, there's a certain guy, I gave you a small snippet of it. Uh, there's small studies. Uh, the uh, present prevalence of H HIV is, is very, very high, 25%, uh, and almost 50% of African-American transgender women. So again, you, you get a transgender woman in your office, you've got to think about HIV, you got to screen, you got to sc HIV, you got to screen them annually. Um, and um, uh, the STDs are also, very, very high. Uh, it's, it's not comfortable to get asked about if they have sex, why they have sex. A lot of them, like uh, Jenner, Christ, is it Christine Jenner, now says she hasn't under, uh, undergone the surgery, so now they may still have a functional penis, and then they're, they're coming to your office as an OBGYN. Very interesting. When I was in Texas, I had a, we had an, a special clinic, a very, very interesting uh, population. You have to ask lots of questions and do lots of screening from lots of different places. So, uh, and again, uh, you, it's just, uh, they just go on and on and on and talk about the asymptomatic STDs and screening. Uh, hepatitis C, screen for hepatitis C. Again, just to tell you, these are the nine changes that, that you have to know about. So STD testing, uh, so specific testing for, for syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia um, uh, every year. Uh, again, many are asymptomatic risk behaviors, screen uh, with um, PAP tests per guidelines, hepatitis C, uh, because of accumulating evidence, you know, they want you to screen them uh, regular, regularly for hepatitis C. Uh, urethritis for men, this is the men start. We won't go through it, just know that they're changed change for men. And the last thing that is that retesting for reinfection. This is where you get stuck because you, you, you have to retest in certain situations. So you retest several months after gonorrhea and chlamydia and trick because you're not looking for failures of treatment. The treatment is really very good. You're looking for reinfection. Again, there's a third party. Unless you get rid of the third party, you know, they, you know they, they, the, guy, every, the, the guy comes in. He, always, he only comes in for two reasons. One, if I'm doing a sexual arousal, sex, sex, sexual study, he wants to make sure she gets her medication. Uh, and two, uh, if she claims that she's got an STD and it's from him and he wants to come along and say, no, it's not me, no, it's not me, no, it's not me. So um, uh, the, uh, it's somebody, and uh, so the chances are really high. So you can't wait for, I'll see you next year. You used to have a positive, you see him in three months uh, because you gotta treat him. Uh, and um, trichomonas, same thing. And diagnosis syphilis, you go through the, re there's the specific recommendations for syphilis, they're different. So any questions? I know I went, went uh, a few minutes over. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so. There's two things that happen. The, the serological tests in the CDC that didn't change the recommendations, they're very, very long and they're very, very helpful. They tell you these are the only tests that are accurate if they're better than 90% accurate. The other ones are 80 plus percent, 85 percent inaccurate. So if you have a result from these tests, it's pretty accurate and you can rely on it. If you have from the other ones, just throw it out the window. For lesions, so like the, the lady with the 
recurrent when she thinks yeast infections, I have her come in and I culture a lesion. But the lesion's only positive for recurrences for one day, two days maybe, maximum four days, but that's rare. So if they don't come in, if they come in three days, even though they still may have a lesion, three days later, that test is usually negative. But I also get a chance to look at it, see that it looks like a, a herpes infection. But you, I say, come in that same day. If I'm not in the office, the nurse will help you get a sample. And I culture it. And then I find out if it's type 1, type 2. And, then, and I can show them, you have a culture you know, of a, a, you know, and it may be you send up a NAP test, but you have a culture. I do one or two, but it's recurrences. In my case, it's usually type two. Type ones don't recur as often, generally. So if you get type one genital, you may get one, two outbreaks in your entire life. In fact, there's a website you can go on tonight, have fun, go on. And uh, in San Francisco, for gay men who are starting out, there's a website where you can go out and get genital type one herpes, because then you'll only have a few recurrences. You won't have the genital type two, and that type one antibody gives you a little bit of protection against type two. It's kind of a their natural vaccination, but it's an actual site where you go find people to uh, to give you type one genital because you won't have recurrent outbreaks. I don't recommend it for anybody, but yes, ma'am. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't quite hear the question. College students. What? Yeah, I, I, I didn't hear the question. Yeah, the question is, you give them an appointment for three months and they don't show up. There's two patient populations that have, that have that. You know, in my private office, I tell them they have chlamydia, you know, and I want to test a cure. You know, they got it from someplace. Unless they know where they got it from, you know, they want to know if it's back, if he got treated. You know, let's assume it's the guy, you know, but sometimes it's the woman. But that, you know, because all guys are dogs. It's all their fault. I heard that over and over again in the office. So she wants to know, is it gone? Is it given back to him? And they usually come back. In our other clinics, they've had chlamydia so many times, they don't care, and they don't have a problem with it. And again, most of the time, it's asymptomatic. And you know, chlamydia doesn't cause PID by itself. It's an intracellular organism that kills one cell at a time. It's that they're at risk for other STDs, and, other, and the, the cells that are dying can get infected. So they've lived, in fact, I have had one patient named her daughter chlamydia. She thought the name was so nice. She, you know, so, so, uh, so, but, so, but answer your question, I give them an appointment. If they, if they don't show up, I, I just check with them once to make sure that you had an appointment for a test to cure, you know, you know, you missed it, you want to come back. If, I don't keep checking after and after. Now, you do that with a mammogram, you know, you're, you're going to get sued, you know. So, but for chlamydia and gonorrhea, I give them one chance and then they're on their own. Because it may be, they know that, you know, it, well, in that case, it's because she was cheating on him, she knows where she got it. Uh, she, and she cut him off, and that's it. So she doesn't think she needs a test to cure it. Yeah. Do you usually expedite it for your therapy in all cases? Am I doing partner therapy? Yeah, but that's. Yeah, I do. I do. I, you know, I, I, I did it. I stopped, and I'm doing it again. The government says you can. OBGYNs, as of almost a little over a year ago, they said you didn't have to. Or you, or you weren't supposed, and ACOG said you weren't supposed to. And the CDC talked to ACOG and said, yeah, we really got to allow them to do it. The problem is that you're not, you don't see the person. And it's hard to. So what, what I do for things like trichomonas is I give her her treatment and I give her a refill. And I say, you know what? You should have your partner tested and treated before you have sex with, sex with him again. However, if you can't get to a doctor or something, I give him your refill and you can get it to him. So it has her name on it. I really don't like 
giving a prescription for with a name of somebody else that that i haven't seen of interesting story was um when um margo hemingway died a few i guess it was ten years ago right she uh her ob joanne was a infectious disease person good friend of mine at ucla and i was calling him up because we were doing some projects together and i said can i talk to you he said right now i can't talk to you the fbi's here i go why is the fbi here he says well margo hemingway died and she had her prescription in my hand and her she had my prescription in her hand i said wow you're in a lot of trouble aren't you he says no no he says he says, my prescription was still in her hand. Whatever killed her was the prescription she filled. So he said, I'm OK. But, uh, <coughs> but yeah, no, I, the government, officially, you're allowed to do it. And, and I think you have limited protection to do it. And you really, it's really, you're really stuck with the pharmacist uh, explaining things. I wouldn't give them, you know, we don't have too many medications in the office. I wouldn't give her a sample for him. Uh, because what happens then is if you give them a prescription, her a prescription, her, they have a chance, the pharmacist has a chance to tell them about all the risks. The risks. Uh, but I, so you, you're, you're not, you're allowed to treat, you're not obligated to treat. What the, all the guidelines say is send them, refer them to the proper specialist. And one little question, Nan, and then we're going to go on. Go ahead. Yeah. But so I usually give a prescription with the person's name on it. Well, what I'm saying is with the refill, I was told that that's insurance fraud. Mm, it's a and yeah, but the I'm other way I was told, well, I give somebody a prescription with the person's name on it, and then I document in my chart that I told them to tell them the risks, that they had no allergies, that they were healthy, and if they had a complication, go to the ER or to their doctor, not to me. Which way am I less in trouble? I'd rather not be sued for 10 million dollars and have the insurance company argue with me but do you but you you're allowed the government says you can write a prescription so you're saying do the refill no i do the refill well, which is, which one is less well i mean well they're both either you get the insurance company mad at you or you get the or you have the you know the lawyers mad at you so it's again you're officially you're you're allowed to do it you're not obligated to do it. You're just obligated to give her the message that he needs to be treated, or it needs to be, needs to be screened and treated, or see if somebody. Okay, let's let's go on to the ne next, and, uh, and I'll I'll be around for questions. <laughs>